Hi, I'm Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage, and welcome to another in our series of In the Shadows of Industry, where we are exploring historic industrial sites on Baltimore's waterfront uh, with our partner, the Baltimore Museum of Industry. And all the sites that we've been doing in this series are within, within a pretty short walking distance, so we hope you come and check them out. Um, I'm going to uh, be joined in a moment by my colleague, Curtis Durham, from the museum. Um, but I think we'll jump right in with a quick thanks to PNC Bank for sponsoring this video and in fact the entire series. All right, today we're going to talk about Chesapeake Paperboard, the Chesapeake Paperboard Company. And I bet that many of you out there have driven past this industrial site, um, whether you've known it or not. If you have ever been on Fort Avenue heading out uh, to Fort McHenry um, and you've looked up, you'll see an enormous water tower that says McHenry Row on it. And that's what it says today. But for decades and decades, it said Chesapeake Vapor Board on it. That was their water tower um, before it became McHenry Row. But we'll get there. Um, uh, Chesapeake Vapor Board was founded in 1910 uh, by a gentleman named James Smith. Um, he was a box maker in Baltimore. And like many box makers, he also made his own paper. And he started here uh, and he used virgin wood um, in 1910. Um, uh, but pretty quickly, by about 1920 or so, he had switched to using almost exclusively recycled paper. And in fact, uh, uh, Chesapeake Paperboard uh, became a, a leader, a, really a pioneer in, recycle, in recycling of paper. Um, the reason he switched, there are two primary reasons. One is he was getting his wood from uh, local lumber yards in the Baltimore area. Uh, but by 1920, 1930, our forests were disappearing as our city was growing and, and central Maryland was growing. So virgin wood became more expensive and harder to find. And the second was we as Americans were starting to use more paper in that period um, just in general across America, but particularly in Washington, D.C. And one of the Chesapeake Paper Board executives called Washington um, the bureaucratic paper capital of the world. And uh, that was somewhat of a joke, but it really wasn't a joke. In fact, the government printing office um, in the 1920s and 30s was sending truckloads of paper up here to uh, Chesapeake Paper Board, um, recycle paper to use again uh, to make boxes and whatnot. Um, let's turn a little bit before we talk about Chesapeake Paper Board and what it was doing, um, back to paper, the paper making itself and the history of paper um, and really how it has always been intertwined with recycling. Um, paper as we know it began in China around 100 AD. Um, there were certainly civilizations before that that were writing on plant-based materials, um, the Egyptians and papyrus, a notable example. But by about 100 AD in China, they were producing paper that we would recognize this paper. Uh, paper did not go like wildfire, though. It took about 900 years uh, to catch on in other parts of the world. By about 1000 AD, the Islamic world was producing paper. Um, and then 200 years later, by about 1200, um, Europe had caught on, particularly in Spain, um, where they had, they invented, people invented a water wheel process to make paper. The first paper with the Chinese and all the way through um, was, was at first made with recycling rags and clothes. Um, this was before we had polyester clothes, uh, oil-based clothes. Um, back then we had plant-based clothes, cotton and hemp and things like that. And that was perfectly good fiber to turn into paper. In America, in Maryland, we started out, remember, as a British colony, and we were at first getting all of our paper from England. Um, they would make it there, they would put it on boats, try to keep it dry, send it over, very expensive. The first paper maker in uh, America was outside of Philadelphia, the Rittenhouse family. And if you've ever been to central Philadelphia and you know the Rittenhouse Square area, that's the same family. Well, they started out in 1690 as America's first paper maker, again using rags and clothes, but, uh, but really looked around at all of the forests that were all around them and switched to using uh, wood and uh, a wood pulp to make their paper. Um, and that caught on. Um, uh, early on, people were trying to figure out how to recycle used paper. None other than Benjamin Franklin in the 1750s was trying to figure out how to take broadsides that had find on the streets of Philadelphia and pulp them up and make new paper out of them. But the challenge was how to get the ink out of the paper. And, uh, and the solution to that did not come from Benjamin Franklin uh, or even from this side of the Atlantic. A gentleman named Matthias Koops 
um, in England. He was an English papermaker. He figured that out, um, sat how to de-ink pulp and, uh, and then get, verg get paper that was pretty white that you could write on. Sadly for him, uh, in the process of doing that, he lost tons of money and lost all of his uh, plant and equipment in a bankruptcy sale. So it didn't end well for him, but he made an incredible contribution. Um, back here in 1910, we've got uh, Chesapeake Paper Board. In World War II, we were recycling everything. If you're a World War II history buff, you know that in Baltimore, we, we recycled um, fountains and iron fences uh, to go back into making Liberty ships and whatnot. And we created an office, the uh, Waste Reclamation Service, to try to encourage all of us Americans in that uh, war effort to recycle things, including paper. Um, and Chesapeake Paper Board was, uh, was ready to go, that had decades of experience by then. Um, paper recycling, though, really didn't take off. We weren't super good at recycling as Americans until in the 1980s, the state of California used uh, its state government um, uh, buying power to, uh, to demand recycled paper content and all of the paper it bought. Um, and that really turned the tables and got people recycling in a big way. Um, but now I'm going to turn it over to Curtis to talk a little bit about what's going on here at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. All right, Curtis, we're all yours. Thank you, Johns, and thank you again, PNC, for your generous sponsorship of this video series. Johns talked a lot about paper, and I'm going to talk a little bit more. In the cultural heritage sphere, um, collections generally refer to physical objects, and archives refer to paper-based materials, including uh, documents and photographs. And that is a lot of what we have in our collection uh, from Chesapeake Paper Board, uh, specifically blueprints. A lot of these blueprints have to do with Chesapeake Paper Board uh, expanding or improving their building and campus. So as you can see here, I have a blueprint of a plot plan for a new stock building. Blueprints are produced uh, through a chemical process. What happens is engineers and architects uh, draw the plans on a separate sheet of paper. A separate tracing paper, which is a very thin, uh, translucent kind of paper, is put over the top of this where the drawings are traced. This tracing paper is then put over the top of uh, a third special chemically altered paper uh, placed in direct sunlight. And then uh, what happens is the ultraviolet radiation from the sun turns, uh, has a chemical reaction, turns the paper blue, but the lines and the designs of the uh, engineers and architects uh, designed from the tracing paper remain white because the sun can't penetrate that part of the document. So it's really important for us to make sure that these kinds of materials are housed appropriately, uh, mainly in a controlled temperature environment so they don't warp or get wet, and also that they're out of direct sunlight, which can uh, really damage, damage the object. Um, blueprints are now obsolete thanks to the onset of computer, computers and um, inkjet, inkjet printers. And so with that, back to you, Johns, for more paper. All right, thanks, Curtis. Um, let me wrap up with a few words. Uh, so we got ourselves up to the 1980s with Chesapeake Paper Board, um, and it was doing pretty well. Its motto, sort of unofficial motto, by the way, was if you can tear it, we can use it. Um, and that they did. They recycled all sorts of stuff, turning them into boxes. Um, if you go over to the corner of your counter right now and pull out a Kleenex, um, odds are the box is made with recycled paper. Uh, 20 or 30 years ago, it probably was made by Chesapeake Paper Board. Same with cereal boxes and a whole host of other products. Um, Chesapeake Paper Board, however, did not make it uh, past 2000. It merged with another paper company, or a series of paper companies, um, and the campus was demolished. All of the buildings were torn down, um, except for that water tower, which now bears the name uh, McHenry Row, but we know as uh, Chesapeake Paper Board. Um, and I'm going to conclude with one kind of neat thing. We're here in the Baltimore Museum of Industry, in one of its sort of packing rooms, um, and they are, uh, at, as we speak, packing up boxes to send to school kids as part of a virtual learning uh, experience. And let me share one of those boxes with you. I'm actually going to walk up here. You can take a look at it. And it says Green Bay Packaging. That is the successor company uh, to Chesapeake Paper Board. And we are standing in mounds and mounds of uh, cardboard boxes uh, made by Chesapeake Paper's uh, successor uh, company. Um, so even though its campus doesn't live on, um, certainly
certainly it's paper making ingenuity does. Um, and again, I'm going to invite you to come on down next time you're going to Fort McHenry or maybe you're going to Harris Teeter or one of the local shops at McHenry Row. Um, make, uh, take a moment to park your car and get out and walk around that wonderful water tower uh, that is a, has been a symbol in South Baltimore for decades. All right, thanks so much and we'll see you next time.